Some mega projects are mega, not because of their physical scale, but through the enormity of their impact. No better is this demonstrated than with the fairy swordfish. Entering service in 1936 with a fleet air arm of the Royal Navy, this World War I throwback of a torpedo bomber with its biplane configuration, tiny top speed, and canvas on wood construction couldn't be less mega at face value. Yet despite this, the swordfish went on to sink more Axis shipping than any other aircraft of the war. And if you think that this antique of an aircraft could only show its teeth to slow, unmarked cargo ships, well, think again. It was such an effective ship hunter that even the most powerful ships in the water, battleships, came to dread the crescendoing hum of an approaching swordfish's underpowered engine, with many of them being sent beneath the waves by its torpedoes. So join us today as we delve into the history of this most unassuming mega project and discover just how it managed to earn its place on this channel. By its on-paper specifications, the Swordfish should have been a disaster. With a top speed of only 143 miles per hour, it certainly was not a race winner. Couple this with its 522 mile range, and it wasn't exactly going to circumnavigate the globe either. Equally poor was its defensive capabilities, as it completely lacked any armor plating and had only a single rear-facing Vickers K machine gun for protection. When it came to offensive armaments, the situation was a bit of a mixed bag, because while it may have only had a single Vickers machine gun to point towards the enemy, it could also carry a really, really big torpedo. Specifically, a Mark 12, a high-tech and modern torpedo designed to be launched exclusively by aircraft. It could also be loaded with 1,500 pounds of bombs rather than a torpedo as and when required. Now, this on paper, at least, wasn't very good. And to understand just how bad these stats truly were, let's compare them to those of the Swordfish's contemporary equivalents, namely the Nakajima B-5N, Japan's go-to torpedo bomber. Introduced only a year after the Swordfish in 1937, it was a sleek, all-metal monoplane design, a stark departure from the wooden canvas British biplane, and it had a top speed of 235 miles per hour and a range of 1,200 miles. It was also a much better performer. Like the Swordfish, it had just a single rear-facing machine gun, typically a Type 92 for defense, and lacked any supplementary armor plating for its crew. For offensive capabilities, the B-5N did away with machine guns altogether and instead relied on a meaty complement of either a Type 91 torpedo or nearly 2,000 pounds of bombs. After all, what use is a machine gun against a ship? So then, by stats at least, it seems blatantly obvious that the Swordfish should have been a joke of an aircraft. So why wasn't it? Well, let's begin to answer that question by bringing this section to a close and diving into its service history. Have you ever felt the digital struggle of standing out online? Well, don't worry, because this video is brought to you by Squarespace. Squarespace is a place where you can build a stunning online presence as easy as ABC. Squarespace has an amazing feature called Flexible Website Templates. It's like having a closet full of stylish outfits, and you could just choose one that suits you, your website. Then you customize it with their fluid engine. It's a drag and drop editor. It's amazing. It's super. I made my own website and I less than an afternoon. Squarespace also just introduced a new feature, courses. You can create and sell your online course seamlessly with professional layouts and the powerful Fluid Engine editor. Turning your knowledge into income is as easy as hitting play. Ready to transform your online presence? Head to squarespace.com for a free trial. And when you're ready to launch, visit squarespace.com forward slash megaprojects to save 10% off your first purchase of a website or a domain using the code megaprojects. And now back to today's video. You see, the swordfish got its first taste of action during the Norwegian campaign of 1940. Here, it stretched its wings and began to show the world what it could do, scouring the icy waves and sinking several German ships with both submarine U-64 and torpedo boat Lux falling victim to the aircraft. At this stage of the war, the Swordfish's success was largely due to the unassuming nature of the aircraft. It was just an antiquated biplane, after all, I mean, what harm could it possibly do? There's no need to panic. 
Well, as U-64 looks could vouch for, there was actually every need to panic. The Swordfish also saw action in the Mediterranean theater. Here, for the entire war, it conducted anti-shipping raids, mining missions, and reconnaissance assignments. In the foremost role, it became the bane of Axis shipping. Between July and August 1941 alone, it sank the German cargo ship Prusen, the Italian tanker Brarina, the Italian cargo ships Nita and Degardi, and the Italian hospital ship California, a total tonnage of over 65,000. They also proved pivotal in traditional or naval engagements in the theater, such as the Battle of Cape Matapan in 1941, where swordfishers, either on their own or with the assistance of surface naval units, sank the heavy cruisers Polar, Zara, and Fiume, and the destroyers Vittorio Alfieri and Giosu Carducci. Here, it appears to be the crew that brought glory, expertly making full use of the one great thing on the swordfish's spec sheet, that giant torpedo. Beyond Europe, in the distant Indian Ocean, the swordfish had a pivotal role in the Battle of Madagascar in 1952. Here, swordfishers were used for both torpedo bombing runs and reconnaissance missions against the Vichy French forces, and managed to sink the armed merchant cruiser Bourgainville and the submarines Breviers and Leros. Their actions expedited the eventual surrender of the Vichy French forces on the islands, with Lieutenant General Robert Sturges, commander of the Allied forces during the battles, specifically commending the swordfish for its role in all but neutering the effectiveness of French naval forces during the battle. Once again, it is the Swordfish's expert crew that takes the credit here, as they made full use of its limited capabilities to ensure victory. But despite these impressive showings, it was not all clear flying for the Swordfish, and great though it was, in the right hands, it still had its problems. In cold regions such as Scandinavia, freezing temperatures often led to its carburetor icing and jammed control surfaces, vastly increasing the labor needed to keep it airworthy. Cold weather wasn't the only concern either. The advanced air defense systems employed by the German and Italian navies also posed a significant threat thanks to the Swordfish's canvas-on-wood design. One hit from an exploding flak round, and the whole aircraft would often just peel apart and completely disintegrate in midair. Ultimately, however, such drawbacks were but blemishes on an otherwise perfect record, and so long as it had that big torpedo and its expert crew, it was happy days for the swordfish. So, now that we have a general understanding of what made the swordfish so good, let's now zoom in on the feats that really made it famous, the battleships it sunk, starting with the Bismarck. Commissioned in August of 1940, Bismarck was one of the most powerful warships ever built, the apex of German naval power with lots of big guns. It also had some of the thickest armor then at sea, and it was fast enough to keep up with other capital ships. The Bismarck was simply a terrifying prospect. In May 1941, accompanied by the heavy cruiser Prinz Eugen, she embarked on Operation Rheinenbung, its maiden voyage aimed at intercepting and destroying Allied convoys in the North Atlantic. The Royal Navy, alert to this threat, was determined to sink her, and dispatched the battleship HMS Prince of Wales, the battlecruiser HMS Hood, and the heavy cruisers HMS Norfolk and HMS Suffolk to make it so. That didn't go well. Hood was absolutely obliterated. A shell from the Bismarck struck it in just the wrong place. A 100-foot-tall blowtorch of flame erupted from the battlecruiser, and mere seconds later, an apocalyptically large explosion erupted, breaking the ship clean in two and sending her multi-ton turrets up into the air and away into the distance. A mere three minutes later, what was left of the Hood disappeared beneath the waves, and all but three of her crew, 1,415 men, eventually joined her. The Royal Navy took this rather badly and diverted all available assets to return the favor. Enter the Swordfish. Once Bismarck was located, a couple of days later, the carrier HMS Ark Royal launched 15 Swordfishers for a strike mission. Bismarck's defenses were formidable, and the sky lit up as every single gun on the soon-to-be-doomed battleship fought desperately to bring the Swordfishes down, but it was all to no avail. The Bismarck's anti-air guns were calibrated for faster, more modern aircraft, and the rounds that would have eviscerated any aircraft they hit simply flew on by harmlessly. The Swordfish's weakness had suddenly become its greatest strength. Unharmed by the anti-aircraft fire, the Swordfishers managed to score two hits with their torpedoes. One of these only caused minor damage to the Bismarck's stern, but the other struck her rudder, completely jamming it up and rendering it useless. This damage was critical. The Bismarck could now only move in predictable circles, making her easy pickings for the Royal Navy, who put everything they had into her all throughout the night. Remarkably, Bismarck stayed afloat through all of this. 
but there was only so much she could take. Even the best of ships have their limits, and in this case, that limit was the cruiser HMS Dorsetshire, pulling alongside her and sending every torpedo she could muster into her, which finally sent the Bismarck down beneath the waves. This was a monumental victory for the swordfish. Sure, it didn't deal the coup de grace, but without its mobilizing of the Bismarck, who knows how many more British ships might have ended up sharing Hood's fate before she was sunk, if it was indeed possible to sink her at all. Furthermore, the fact that the swordfish's attack was successful because it was such a slow and antiquated design is not just ironic, it is intrinsic. But we will come back to evaluating the reasons for the swordfish's success later. For now, put that thought on ice, and let's take another look at an instance of battleship slaying. On the night of the 11th to the 12th of November 1940, the Royal Navy launched a bold air raid on the Italian naval base at Taranto. The primary goal was to neutralize the Italian battle fleet, which was threatening British control of the Mediterranean. The fleet at Taranto also included a significant portion of Italy's capital ships, making it a high-value target. For the operation, 21 swordfishers took off from the aircraft carrier HMS Illustrious. These aircraft were divided into two waves, each armed with torpedoes or bombs. The first wave of 12 aircraft attacked shortly after 11 p.m. They faced fierce anti-aircraft fire and balloon barrages, but pressed on with their attack nonetheless. Their targets were the onshore seaplane facilities and anything big that was moored up in port. The second wave, consisting of nine aircraft, arrived a little over an hour later. Like the wave before them, their floating targets were the big stuff, but for shore targets, they were ordered to focus on the oil storage facilities. As you're probably suspecting this far into the video, this went rather well, and the raid was devastating, with the Italian Navy losing three battleships. The first was the Conte Cavour, which was hit by a torpedo, sunk, and settled on the shallow harbor floor. Although later refloated, she was never fully repaired during the war. Next was the Littorio, which suffered three torpedo hits. She too was sunk by the damage, although the Italians managed to repair her, and she returned to service in 1941. Then there was the Cayo Duilo. Damaged by one torpedo, she was saved from sinking only by being intentionally run aground and was returned to service after a few months of repairs and overhaul. The loss of these battleships, one permanently and two temporarily, was an enormous blow to the Italian Navy. Battleships were enormous investments of time, materials, and manpower. They took several years and thousands of tons of steel to construct, and each ship required extensive training for its large crew. This made them invaluable assets, and their sinking or incapacitation meant not just the immediate loss of their firepower, but also the squandering of immense resources and the damaging of national prestige. A battleship being written off in wartime was, in practical terms, a loss that was impossible to replace. Then, there were the other losses during the raid. Three cruisers were damaged, the heavy cruisers Trieste and Bolzano, as well as the light cruiser Duca d'Eglia Bruzzi. This was in addition to two destroyers, which experienced varying degrees of damage, further limiting the Regia Marina's operational capacities. Additionally, many auxiliary vessels which played crucial roles in supply and logistics were destroyed, thereby hampering the Navy's sustainment capabilities for operations. The cost of this astounding victory? Two swordfishers lost. A pretty good ratio by any standard. The Royal Navy had effectively neutralized half of Italy's battleship fleet in a single night, shifting the balance of power in the Mediterranean in their favor, and considerably so. And all of this was thanks to that plucky little antique, the swordfish. So, now we can be pretty certain why the swordfish was so good. The skill of its crew, the quality of its torpedo, and weirdly just how bloody slow it was. But what do the historians say? What do those veritable wrinkly brains who dedicate their lives to figuring this stuff out think? Any exploration of the swordfish should look at this, so now let's take a look for ourselves. First, we have David Ragg. In his work, Swordfish, the Story of the Taranto Raid, Ragg states that the very antiquity of the swordfish was a component of its success, its slow speed paradoxically making it harder for faster enemy aircraft and anti-aircraft artillery to target. Moreover, its canvas on wood construction produced a surprisingly low radar signature, making it challenging for enemy ships to detect. Ragg also emphasized the skill of the Royal Navy's fleet air arms crew, arguing that their training and tactics 
tactics were tailored to maximize the swordfish's unique attributes. An agreeable perspective, for sure. And then there is Anna Ritterau, who allows us to build on this further. In his book The Fairy Swordfish, Marks 1 through 4, he delves deep into the technical aspects of the aircraft and reaches some interesting conclusions. He agrees with Rag's sentiment that the swordfish's simplicity was its strength, but adds a new dimension to the discussion, claiming that the aircraft's rugged design meant it could take off from various platforms, be it carriers in rough seas or makeshift airfields. Furthermore, he claims its mechanical simplicity made it easier to maintain and repair, particularly in the field and under combat conditions. In his view, in a world of complex machinery and sophisticated aircraft, the simplicity of the swordfish provided an unforeseen advantage, an aircraft that could be trusted to actually be available when it was needed. And next we've got Patrick Bishop. In his book Target Turpits, he explores the swordfish's role in performing reconnaissance duties, stating that this joint capability as both a competent bomber and an observer made it a Swiss army knife of aircraft, a trait that in the cramped hold of an aircraft carrier where every spare inch of space must be put to productive use made the swordfish invaluable. There would always be a swordfish there to do what needed to be done. The perspectives of these historians are invaluable for us today. They vindicate our own findings and tell us that we're on the right path. They offer a bit of extra nuance to our pre-established positions, and they also offer new angles and perspectives that we might have otherwise dismissed. The most crucial detail for all, though, today is that not one of them spoke negatively of the swordfish. It is an aircraft which is universally beloved by historians, and one that is consistently rated as one of the most underrated and ultimately surprising aircraft of World War II. And so with that done, all that's left for us to do is compile everything we have learned in this video and render some final thoughts. So the Swordfish, despite its underwhelming specifications on paper, is undoubtedly one of the most surprisingly capable aircraft in history, and it more than earns its place as a mega project. It was a joke of an aircraft, one dismissed as an outdated heap of junk by both friends and foe alike. But as Europe fell into the dark throes of war and the swordfish was called upon to do its part, the joke suddenly stopped being funny. Ship after ship fell beneath the waves under the pounding onslaught of its bombs and torpedoes. But what truly makes the swordfish story remarkable is the sheer absurdity of it all. By all metrics, it should not have been even half the aircraft it proved to be. And yet, in a twist of irony, it was these very metrics that made it such a dangerous thing to behold. So old-looking as to appear unassuming to the ignorant eye, and slow enough as to often be rendered all but invulnerable to enemy fire. Its success, ultimately, was a fluke. No one had anywhere predicting it before war broke out, and certainly the idea of a so-bad-it-becomes-good aircraft is not something that any rational military would attempt to replicate in the modern day. Underdog stories such as the Swordfish are the exception, not the rule. Bad, although we are begrudged to use that word regarding the Swordfish aircraft, are typically just that. They're bad. For every one swordfish, there are a hundred other bad designs that don't work. They fail their missions and they get their crews killed. But it is exactly these odds that makes the swordfish so memorable and endearing. It was a success story that shouldn't have happened. And yet it absolutely did.